Welcome to Numerical Methods. So now I like to start a new section on uh, random number generation. But of course, we will return to the Monte Carlo method again, yeah, because we will first discuss pseudo-random number generators, and we will then learn something about the properties of the random number sequences that are important yeah, in the application yeah, when we use the random number sequences for Monte Carlo approximations. So pseudo-random number generators, well, actually this term is maybe not very precisely defined. Yeah? So the thing is that you have a sequence of numbers and the prediction of this sequence is very hard. So the sequence looks uh, random, but you know, since it is a random number generator, it's an algorithm, the pseudo refers to that the number could be predicted. So it's generated by yeah, a deterministic algorithm. So this word, yeah, hmm, prediction is very hard. So this is not uh, very precise. An example for a pseudo random number generator are the linear concurrential generator and the linear concurrential generator. Yeah, it takes some constants. So there is an A here. So this is a natural number, so an integer. There is a C here and there is, say, an initial value of this sequence, the x0. And there is another constant m. And then from our initial value x0, I calculate the next value of my sequence. So my sequence is xi. I runs from 1, 2, 3, and so on. For xi, I calculated I calculate now a times xi minus one, the previous value, plus c. Okay, so this is integer arithmetic, and then I take it modulus m. Yeah, if you like to draw a small picture, so this looks like that. Maybe you have your numbers here on this circle. Okay, so say the Zero is here, the one is here, two is here, okay, and then you run around, okay, so the last number is the m minus one, so everything is taken modulus m, so you could think of a gap being here, yeah, there's a small gap. Uh, yeah, you perform your uh, operation on this circle. So for example, if you have here one number, yeah, that is now your xi minus one. Yeah, then you perform the operation on this circle. So you multiply with a, add a c, yeah. So you run here and the modulus tells you that you run around and around. So if you are larger than m, yeah, okay, you just jump to the next value starting in in zero. So this is a little bit like a wheel of fortune. Yeah. So we are just turning here this wheel of fortune and the velocity by which we turn this wheel of fortune yeah, also depends a little bit on the previous value. Okay, you could say. Yeah, that you have a small uh, wheel of fortune. Yeah, maybe you can you can look up the constants here, yeah, a and c, yeah, and of course a is not a small number because if a would be a small number, it would mean that uh, we would maybe just make a very small step on this, yeah, wheel here, and if c would also be a small number, yeah, we just make a very small step. For example, a stupid choice would be a equals zero, and c is just a small number, then it makes, you just make 
small steps on this wheel. So the A is a large number, so that A times Xi minus one, yeah, is yeah, very likely um, a number that has gone around and around for many times. Yeah? And of course, the C has to be there if Xi minus one is zero, yeah? you would like to, to move again. Yeah, this generator uh, looks very simple, but uh, a sequence generated with this algorithm looks for suitable parameters already quite random. So many such built-in random number generators are uh, linear concurrential generators. For example, our Java util random is a linear concurrential generator where the parameter m yeah, is 2 to the power of 48, yeah? so 10 to the 14. Uh, and also a uh, and c are also uh, Given if you we can, we can look it up, yeah. Uh, so A is also a quite a large number. These generators have some negative properties. Yeah, they are simple. Yeah, but they are not that good. For example, you can look up the result that um, if you use this generator and then generate a d-dimensional vector from it using our algorithm of populating each component after the other, then this yi this lies on at most m to the power of one divided by d um, hyperplanes so that means uh, if you for example choose here the d a bit larger yeah only a bit larger yeah you can you can just see that you have quite few hyperplanes. Um, if you if you simulate this, you don't see the effect very easily yeah? because lying on a hyperplane just means that there is a linear combination of your components yeah? that is maybe zero or something like that. Yeah? So if you take some normal form or, or is a constant. yeah. So there is a linear combination that does not have enough variability. But to find the coefficients of this linear combination is then not so easy, but you cannot be sure. Okay, so there is this, this effect. Let me define a few important uh, things. So there is the period length. Yeah, of course, the period length is when the random number sequence starts to repeat. Okay, so the period of the sequence is the smallest number p such that xi plus p is equal to xi. So this is called the period length of the random number sequence. And then we call the smallest possible uh, period under a random number generator, the period length of that random number generator. Okay, so this is the period length of a random number generator. Well, the period length of a linear concurrential generator, as we have just defined, this is at most m. And you see that we should therefore choose uh, the number m quite large. Okay, so why is that? Yeah, you see, if we have the same number again, then the sequence will repeat, yeah, because the sequence just depends on the previous number. But there are only m different numbers. So after m numbers, you can be sure that you will get again a number that had already occurred before. Yeah. So I, our period length is um, at most m. Another popular random number generator, and I also already used this uh, in our numerical experiments on the Monte Carlo method, is the Mersenne twister. So this is a very good popular random number generator, sometimes called MT19937. And this random number generator, this has now a huge period length. So this guy has a period length of 2 to the power of 19,937 minus 1. Yeah? So this random number generator repeats 
after that that many uh, values. Also, the random number generator is good for sampling random vectors in higher dimensions. So they checked the property of this random number generator and they saw that it has good properties up to 623 dimensions. Okay, so now you think, okay, that, that's crazy. Where do we have an application that I like to calculate a 623 dimensional integral? And the thing is that if we talk later about the time discretization of stochastic process, you will see that a time step in a stochastic process is an independent random increment. So every time step is an independent random increment means that all those time steps are, until you are at the end are actually a random vector where the dimension of the random vector is the number of time steps. And if you now perform a time step discretization with 500 points, you actually have a 500 dimensional problem. Yeah. So um, later we will discuss this and I will also make this remark again, but the MT yeah, is maybe then a nice guy here for an n-dimensional stochastic process, yeah, drawing n sequential random numbers in each time step. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a short remark on. Yeah, maybe a remark on the Mersenne twister. It is not a linear concurrential generator, so the method that they use is uh, far more involved, far more complicated. But it has some similarities, because what you saw for the linear concurrential generator is we operate on this um, x i minus one. We have an operation on it and we create out of it the next value. And the Mersenne twister also operates on the previous value to create the next value. But the operation is a bit more involved. But not only is the operation more involved, for example, for the linear concurrential generator, we create an integer out of the previous integer. And if your integer has 32 bit, okay, so then your LCG is working on a 32 bit word. Yeah. Actually, the Java util random is using a 48 bit word to create the new 48 bit word. And the Mersenne twister actually uses a, and that's why it's, it's named like that, a 90,968-bit word. Huh? That's a strange uh, number, but this is just that you have 624 integers of 32 bits that form this state of this random gen number generator, out of which he will create the new state. We can uh, have a look at this um, implementation. So you know that our, um, say, uh, numerical methods, lecture repository, but also our financial mathematics library, we use as a Maven dependency, we use Apache Common Math. Okay, so that is a library where you have some mathematical algorithms and there is a package called random. And in this package random, you find an impl implementation of the Mersenne Twister. So you also find the original reference. And here you see that you have this constant. So there is 624 and this constant N is used to initialize an array of integer. So this MT is actually the previous value out of which we generate the new value and out of which we then calculate the random number. And this MT is now yeah, a sequence of these 90,000 bits, yeah, 624 integers of 32 bits. And if you then scroll down, you see that he is operating on this object yeah, and doing some hmm, fancy, fancy stuff here. Another important object related to 
the pseudo random number generators is the seed. Yeah. So often these random number generators allow us to specify a seed value. So the seed of a random number generator is a value, yeah, usually an integer that uniquely determines the sequence. And important aspect is it thus allows us to reproduce the sequence. So for the linear concurrential generator, the seed is just the initial value. Yeah? So given all the other quantities are constants. And for the MT, it's also the initial value of this 624 integer array. Yeah? Okay, but specifying 624 integers is a bit uh, well, cumbersome. So the Mersenne twister also allows us to specify a single integer seed. And out of this, he will generate uh, the state and then uh, creates the sequence. So this important feature is that the same seed will generate the same sequence. So using fixed seeds allows us to reproduce our numerical experiment. This is really important because if you have this um, property, uh, you can test your implementation. And then if you spot an error, you get always the same result. Yeah? Otherwise, debugging would be maybe a little bit uh, difficult. You have to be a little bit careful with thinking that different seeds uh, generate independent sequences. Yeah, So different seeds generate different sequences, usually, but it's not guaranteed that sampling the seed is a good way of creating independent sequences. So you have to be a little bit careful with this. Yeah. Uh, so note it is not guaranteed that two sequences with different seeds are a good representation of drawing a random vector with IID components. So you could think you take a one-dimensional sequence with one seed yeah? And then you take another one-dimensional sequence with a different seed, and these two one-dimensional sequences define you now a vector in two dimensions. This is not a good te technique. It's better, at least for the pseudo-random number generators, to use the algorithm and take a one-dimensional and populate it one by the other. Uh, but that said, I often do this. Yeah, I often uh, sample also uh, by, by changing um, the seed. Yeah, maybe we have a small um, experiment to the seed. Uh, so the first one, we could just take a look at Java util random for uh, different seeds. I already prepared this. Okay, these are a bit simple experiments. So maybe not so much involved with the live coding. So I have a small program. I specify here the constant. This is the seed. I specify how much number of sample points I would like to generate. And then I create here the Java util random. Yeah, the Java util random random number generator. So if you look at the documentation, this guy is um, a linear concurrential random number generator. Yeah, this guy offers many different uh methods. For example, it allows me to get the next integer. Yeah? So the next integer is a 32-bit integer. I also can generate floating point random numbers, which are then between um, 0 and 1. Yeah, So maybe I use the float oh, because it looks a little bit nicer. And let's run this program. And you see I get here the first 30 elements of this sequence with the seed. And now if you run this program again and again, you see I always get the same sequence. So the seed is entering here. If I change the seed, then I get a new sequence. Okay, so that's the seed. We can now perform our Monte Carlo integration with different seeds of the random number generator with different Monte Carlo seeds. So we go back to our Monte Carlo integration. Yeah, we had a Monte Carlo integrator and that Monte Carlo integrator has the number generator here as an input. 
And with this guy, we had this little experiment where I created here our Monte Carlo integrator and we were integrating here the cosine. I just copied this experiment yeah, from the last time. Uh, so you see here, this function is exactly what we did uh, before. So we take our Monte Carlo integrator, our integrator 1D, we integrate the cosine and we compare with the analytic solution. So we see that we see the true error yeah, because we know the analytic solution. So what I do is um, I initialize now our Monte Carlo integrator with a Mersenne twister and I initialize it with different seeds. So let me have a collection of seeds, 3141, 1313, 1, 16, 3, 2. Yeah, and then I call this method. And if I have this parameter true here, he will actually uh, print the result. So maybe I just run this and we see now three of our last Monte Carlo integrations are uh, four uh, with different seeds. And what you see is that, well, the results really differ a lot. Okay, so we use here 10,000 sample paths, right? That is 10 to the power of four. So we should expect that the Monte Carlo error is one divided by square root of 10 to the power of four is one divided by 10 to the power of two. Yeah, And that's also what we see here sometimes, okay? That's our Monte Carlo error. But you see that sometimes we are actually almost by a factor of 10 worse, right? So that's here our theorem 25 that actually was just our convergence rate. So that's the issue that we have this only in probability because what I'm doing now is I'm using a different sequence and a different sequence means I just use a different omega again and again. And you see, I have the probability that I miss my bound. But sometimes I'm also a bit closer. Yeah, so you see, I get here a factor of two improvement. Yeah, so I already see here 10 to the minus three. Yeah, okay, nine times 10 to the minus three. So you see the uh, Monte Carlo error really differs by this seed. Here below, uh, I do the same experiment again, but now I use 10,000 different seeds. Yeah, so you see, I now use a random number generator to generate here a random number, and this random number is the seed of the sequence. So I'm sampling different sequences with different seeds. Actually, I should not do it, but I do it, yeah. So, and then I calculate here the integral, and this function below just returns the error. So I just added here a return error, and I just collect all these errors here in um, a list, and then I have a fancy function that plots the distribution of these errors. And this looks like that. So this is the error distribution. Okay, so you see the central limit theorem, the error distribution looks like a normal. Yeah. And yeah, you see that our Monte Carlo error using different seeds yeah, can sometimes be much larger. So note that some seeds give poor results and maybe it's best if you have an experiment or if you have some simulation to change the seed and check a little bit how the uh, result uh, is affected by changing the seed. Yeah, the linear concurrential generator I introduced is generating a sequence of integer. Yeah, we use modulus M in our um, definition. And also the Mersenne twister is actually generating a bit sequence, a sequence of yeah, 90,000 bits yeah, or 624 integers. But in my Monte Carlo approximation, I always use uniform distribution on zero one. Yeah, okay, this is a trivial transformation. So if you like to be uniform on zero one, yeah, what you do is you know that 
x is an integer between 0 and m, 0 included, m not included. Yeah, x is my linear concurrential generator with a modulus m. So m minus 1 is the last integer number. And then we just do x divided by m to get a number between 0 included and 1 not included. And clearly, if the integer sequence is uniform yeah, on actually its set, yeah, then my sequence x divided by m is uniform on 0, 1. Well, one has to be a little bit careful here. There could be a, a rounding error. Yeah. So however, there could be a rounding error. And that's the reason why we have to maybe choose the m appropriately. So we have the following lemma. And now we come back to computer arithmetics that we need to understand how the computer represents the floating point number. So you remember maybe the floating point number, the so-called normalized ones, they were one plus C divided by two to the power of P. C between zero included, two to the power of P not included. Yeah? So this guy is between one included, two not included. And then multiplied with some scale, some exponent, two to the power of E. So this is the normalized floating point number representation that we had. And the P was, for example, for double 52, uh, for float it was 23, I believe. And now I have the little lemma that if we choose the M to be two to the power of P plus one, uh, so that would be a two to the power of 53 for the floating point doubles, uh, or a two to the power of 24 for the single position floating point numbers, then x divided by m is a floating point number. So this means there is no rounding. Huh? Okay, so p is the number of the bits of the mantissa. Yeah, so I use exactly the same notation and to this we have in our uh, chapter on computer arithmetic. Yeah, can we see this? Um, so if x is equal to zero, it is a denormalized floating point number. Okay, so there's nothing to do if x is equal to zero. And for x larger than zero, the claim is that I have a normalized floating point number. So if x is larger than zero, then I can find k yeah, such that two to the power of k is less or equal x and x is uh, less than 2 to the power of k plus 1. So actually, k should be the number, yeah, actually where x lies in this interval. Yeah, then if you just uh, subtract here from this 2 to the power of k, so you have that x minus 2 to the power of k is between 0 and 2 to the power of k. So I have my um, x here. I divide by m. Yeah, then I can represent this as 2 to the power of k plus x minus 2 to the power of k. So this is 2 to the power of k plus x minus 2 to the power of k. And the reason why I'm doing this is I would like to get somehow this 1 in my normalized floating point number. So to get this, I just pull out the factor two to the power of K divided by M. So this M here moves out huh? and it is as if I would divide this by two to the power of K. So I see that this here becomes then the two to the power of K divided by two to the power of K, the one. 
And I have the x minus 2 to the power of k divided by 2 to the power of k. OK, because of this here, this guy is now a number between 0 included, 1 not included. Yeah, I like to introduce my base here, the 2 to the power of p. So let's divide by the 2 to the power of p. So I divide here with the 2 to the power of p. Of course, I have to fix this because originally, originally my division was a 2 to the power of k. That guy is now here. Okay, and I have a 1 plus, and now I have a C. This guy here is my C, divided by 2 to the power of P. And the factor that I have pulled out here, that guy can be represented as my um, exponent. Uh, so this guy is just my 2 to the power of e, yeah, because my m, yeah, my m was chosen, recall here on top, as 2 to the power of p plus 1. And now I have written it in the form of the normalized floating point number, and I just have to check that these quantities, so the c and the e that we have now here, that these quantities yeah, are in the correct range. Yeah, you see that, yeah, so because I have this, this guy is between zero and two to the power of K. Yeah, so the product uh, is between zero and two to the power of P. Okay, so this is okay. And yeah, my exponent is also just a ex exponent of my floating point representation. Okay, so you have this property that if we choose the M in a suitable way, then there is no rounding. The random number generation is exact in the sense of this I triple E floating point um, arithmetic. And maybe it's interesting to look that they really do this in the implementation. So you can look this up. So here is the link, for example, to the documentation. Okay, so this is the documentation of our linear concurrential generator. And if you scroll down, you see there is a function that generates single precision floating point numbers, and there's a function that generates double precision floating point numbers. So if you click on the method that generates the single precision floating point number, you see they use indeed a 24 bit integer, so that this guy is between 0 and 2 to the power of 24, not included, integer sequence, and then they, they divide by 2 to the power of 24. So the m is indeed uh, 2 to the power of 24. Um, also very nice is that they have a small comment here that in an earlier version of this um, random number generator, they divided by 2 to the power of 30. Yeah, So they used the 30-bit sequence and divided by 2 to the power of 30 to generate this floating point number. And um, they have here this comment that this looks equivalent. Yeah, And also it looks maybe even better. Yeah, You generate maybe a higher accurate floating point number or whatever, but this introduces slight non-uniformity because of floating point number rounding. So a subtle thing that this really mattered and they changed the implementation. If you look at the implementation for the double precision ones, yeah, they divide here by two to the power of 53. Yeah, so maybe this is a strange notation, but this is just shift one bit by 53 positions. This is two to the power of 53. And they generate the integer number by actually, since this generates does not operate on 53 bits by first sampling 26 bits, shifting it, and then 
sampling 27 bits. Yeah. And also in earlier version, they actually did it slightly, slightly well. Okay, so now we know how to generate a random number sequence in zero one. And now I can also come back again to our little algorithm and I know how to generate a sequence in two dimension, yeah, zero one squared. So I can generate from this a sequence in zero one squared and here is a small example. I should do this. Yeah. So I should take now my random number generator and generate. And maybe I plot a small scatter. And I used this scatter yeah, already when I discussed this algorithm of populating the components one by the other. So maybe we just have a look. So this is in our package called random numbers plots. Uh, so here I have discussed this previously. So you you see I use my linear concurrential generator here with a given seed. Yeah? And then I loop over the number of sample vectors. And each sample vector is populated by two one-dimensional, yeah? two random numbers. So first I take the X component, then I take the Y component. Yeah, I I store this here in these two uh, lists and then plot the x, y uh, scatter. Let's run that. Yeah, and we get a picture like that. And the reason why I would like to conclude this session with this picture is that this motivates now our next section that we discuss the discrepancy of such random number sequences, which will then lead to the very nice cox lafka inequality, which allows us to remove this probabil probability in our error estimate. So if you look at this picture, what is happening here? Yeah, this is a random number sequence. So there are some places where you have multiple points in a small area. On the other hand, there are also places where you have no points. Okay. And now comes the question, is this a good property? Because think of what we did when I discussed the curse of dimension and why you can find a function for a classical integration rule that is very unsuitable for this integration rule. If you see such a picture, I can find a function that is may maybe very unsuitable for this sampling. Uh, there are also here areas where we have very few points. So just use a, a, a function that is always zero, except in this area. Uh, maybe there you have some mountain. If you integrate this function with this sampling here, you will get a zero because he's always calculating zero and the integral will have a large um, error. Of course, the Monte Carlo method does not have this problem because if we run another sequence, he will very likely populate this area. So the Monte Carlo method does not have this problem in probability, but a sequence could have this problem. So I would like to define a property that somehow tells me, is the sequence nicely distributed? So do we have maybe regions where we are wasting points? We have too many. And do we have regions where we have too few points? And this property, it's a property of the sequence, is the discre discrepancy. And then we take the next journey to find sequences that have low discrepancy, low discrepancy sequences. That was it for today. <laughs>